Hey, welcome to Little Rock. Welcome to On the Same Page. Welcome to the Arkansas Literary Festival. As you can see, lots of books, lots of authors in attendance. And the author we're going to concentrate on today is Buzz Bissinger. Buzz Bissinger, the author of Friday Night Lights, the Pulitzer Award-winning book about high school football in West Texas. He's got a new book. This one's called Three Nights in August, Strategy, Heartbreak, and Joy Inside the Mind of a Manager. And of special interest to most baseball fans in Arkansas, that manager is none other than Tony La Russa of the St. Louis Cardinals. Kane Webb will have a conversation with the author. We'll be back to have a conversation with some fellow Arkansas readers about three nights in August. We're here at the Arkansas Literary Festival with best-selling author Buzz Bissinger, also a contributing editor to Vanity Fair. His latest book is Three Nights in August, Strategy, Heartbreak, and Joy Inside the Mind of a Manager. The manager is Tony La Russa of the St. Louis Cardinals. The three games are with the Cardinals and the Cubs in August of 2003. And the writer here with us is Buzz Bissinger. Thanks for joining us, Buzz. Hey, thank you. Tell us a little bit about what attracted you to this project and why you decided uh, to do a book about it. Tony La Russa at baseball. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a big sports fan. My first book uh, was about high school football in Texas, Friday Night Lights, although I don't consider myself a sports writer, writer, but baseball is my first love. And actually what happened was at the end of 2002, Tony La Russa approached me. He was interested in doing a book and collaborating with someone, and he came to me because he loved uh, Friday Night Lights. And I almost impulsively, I just basically impulsively said, yes, let's do it, because I like the Cardinals, a lot of mythology to the Cardinals, the Gas House Gang and Dizzy and, and Daffy and Stan Musial, a classy, interesting organization. And I had seen Tony for years, you know, on TV in the dugout. I never met him, but he's got the, he never smiles. I think in the book I describe him as a glacier with a migraine. You, know, you just feel the intensity and pressure uh, pouring off his face. So it was the writer's challenge of, you know, what's behind the face? Can you get behind that? into what I knew was a very deep and intricate and complex mind about the game of baseball. Luckily for the readers, it's not an as-told-to right. book. When I looked at the back cover and saw you and Tony <laughs> together, I thought, You got oh. nervous. Yeah, I did. but it's not. It's a, it's a very objective well, you know, person I mean, you're right. To, you're, you were right to get nervous, and I got nervous. I mean, yeah. originally this was going to be, you know, a traditional as-told-to, you know, pocket some change, get it out quickly. Uh, the Cardinals had been through a very emotional 2002 season with the death of, of pitcher... Daryl Kyle, you know, Tony had brought the team back. They had almost gotten into the World Series. But I, I don't want to do it as told to. They're, they're, they're boring. They're self-congratulatory. They never say anything. You know, and, and as Tony and I had sort of initial exploratory conversations, said, I want, I want Friday Night Lights. I want all that great writing, you know, and vividness and observation. And I said, Tony, I want Friday Night Lights too or try to get something close. But if you want that to happen, I need access to the team for the 2003 season because I feast off access. It gives you a, that wonderful, you know, you are there quality mm -hmm. uh, for readers. You need to be revealing. You need to say things, not tawdry things, you know, not to be a, a managerial version of Jose Canseco, but to say things, revealing about strategy, about yourself personally, about the, the state of the modern day ball player. And uh, probably most important, you know, you, you have to give me the latitude to take this book in the direction I want to take it in. Because I, I, this is not a biography of Tony La Russa. There are a lot of other dimensions yeah. and players and, and personalities within it. When he said he wanted Friday Night Lights, did he realize how controversial that book was when it first came out? Yeah, I mean, he, he had read it. And I don't mm -hmm. think he was looking for the controversial yeah. aspect. Of, let's, let's face it, controversy is good. You know? and it, uh, it does help sell things uh, in life. He just liked the book. I mean, he liked the way it was written. He liked the vividness yeah. of it. He, as I say, he liked the, the observational uh, qualities of it. And the thing about Tony is, you know, I think uh, to people who haven't met him, the fans, there's an aloofness, maybe even an arrogance. He is not that type of guy at all. He's very self-effacing. There's a shyness to him. But when Tony commits, he's very thoughtful. Mm -hmm. He's not an off-the-handle type of guy. When he commits, he commits. And he really did commit to taking a leap and trusting me and doing what I think is a virtually totally different book in the genre of, of sports books. Yeah, he gave you a lot of access, not just to the team, but to himself. One of yes, the things did. that fascinated right. me, some of the best 
parts of the book are that the stuff that happens outside the lines. Right. Uh, for instance, Tony LaRusso's private life, which just amazed me, the, the way he lives from spring training to October. Mm -hmm. tell, tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's not the kind of life that I would want to live, and I think you would want to live, or most people want to live. I mean, Tony has been successful. You know, he's going to be, become this season unless the Colonels just break apart, and they won't. I mean, he'll become the third winningest manager of all time, you know, behind Connie Mack and, and John McGraw. But you pay a price for that obsession, and mm -hmm. he is obsessed with baseball. So he does not live with his family during the season. As you say, from spring training on, he basically lives in a hotel suite in St. Louis. His family has remained behind his beautiful wife and two daughters in Northern California. And the reason was uh, when Tony got the Cardinals job in 96, Elaine said, Tony, we don't want to go. We've seen you when you're here because you're not there. You're consumed by the game. The game makes you moody. The game makes you depressed. It's all that you really care about. This will enable you to go to St. Louis and focus on nothing but baseball and will enable me as, as, as a mother and the mother of, of my kids for us, us to have an identity and have a life. So it's and great it works, for fans. Yeah. It's great for fans because Tony does nothing but concentrate on baseball and it works within the terms of their marriage. But there is a loneliness to him. I mean, he is a very isolated uh, guy. Even in the dugout. Oh, yeah. I mean... The only person he ever talks to in the dugout is his pitching coach, Dave Duncan, but Tony takes all responsibilities upon himself. You know, I, I sort of, baseball is kind of a beautiful game, and what is beautiful about it is often what doesn't take place on the field. I love the way Bobby Cox, the Atlanta Braves, you know, he's always talking to Leo Mazzoni or, or yeah. Joe Torre, the Yankee manager, has his, used to have his Pilachi, who was, you know, uh, Don Zimmer. You know, they're always chatting and talking. Tony does none of that. I mean, I call it the foxhole. And it really is his very, nice very lady. lonely foxhole. It's not a clubhouse confidential, but I wonder if when you first joined the team, the players were kind of worried that this might be in the works. How did they take to having essentially an embedded reporter with them with a lot of right. access and the That's okay right. of the man? That's right, embedded in the war of baseball. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that was the one thing Tony was very worried about. You know, he said, I will give you access, access to private meetings, to team meetings, to the, the pitching meetings, and the and the hitters' meetings, but you know, you have to tread quietly because if, if you alienate players, if they're worried that I'm preoccupied with this book, if they think you're snooping around trying to get them in some game of gotcha, uh -huh. then I'll pull out of the book. So as a reporter that presents challenges as a writer, for the first three months, I didn't really approach a single player probably till the end of June. I, I tread very quietly. I just wanted them to get to use the fact that I was there and could be there without making a nuisance of myself. Reporters do often make nuisances of themselves. And then bit by bit, began to approach them. And I learned about players, they actually like, they love talking about the game. Mm -hmm. They really do. They, the questions they hate, and I don't blame it, is, is the ridiculous, obvious question. How'd you feel when you gave out the home run in the bottom of the ninth? Yeah. Well, what do, you, what do you expect the pitcher to say? You know, I feel great. I hear the guy's on welfare, and then he feels <laughs> terrible. They love, when you say, take me through that at bat. Yeah. What, what were you thinking as the pitcher? What were you thinking as the hitter? They love talking about the intricacies uh, of the game. So it really began, began to work, and they did not feel threatened. And there, there's a lot of strategy in the book. What? I think it, the one at bat goes on for about two and a half pages. It's, it's good stuff, right. but you can overdo the baseball strategy in a book like well, this. Well, you but. can, and it's a really slippery slope in a book like this because, you know, I, I have often said to myself and thinking about, you know, a little bit of baseball strategy goes a really long way. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can sound like physics, it becomes incredibly complex. I mean, I've read books, I don't know what the hell is going on, you know, I don't know what they're talking about. On the other hand, you need to make this book appeal both to people who simply have a casual interest in the game, but it has to appeal to knowledgeable fans. And there are a lot of knowledgeable fans. So if they read the book and they say, well, I knew all this stuff, uh, you're sunk. So, so the real writing challenge is how do you make that strategy interesting and lively and provocative. I mean, and and you, you know, you're right, it was about So Taguchi, who mm -hmm. may have played in Arkansas for a little bit. Um, it just takes him, it takes the reader through an at-bat two and a half pages where he doesn't even get a hit. Um, but it was interesting because it shows you know, the importance of taking pitches and, and, how and, and man, working at pitcher's yeah. pitch count and how Tony as a manager says that's the best at-bat of the game, even though he flies out because he really works Cubs pitcher Kerry Wood deep 
and basically gets, gets them out of the ball game. And that's what I love about baseball is all those little tiny complexities that make it, I think, really a, a, a magnificent game. Yeah, a manager sees a game differently yeah. than we do. Right. Do you see a game differently now after spending time with Well, Lewis? I do. I mean, you know, I just appreciate all sorts of sort of the hidden aspects of the game. You know, I, what I love about baseball is just the fluid dynamics, what I call the, this wonderful system of pulleys and levers that was that uh, the founding fathers of baseball invented. How, you know, with, with each change in the count, the whole dynamics change you know I love it when a guy gets the first base and is he yeah. taking a hit and run lead is he taking a steal lead is it just a decoy or is Tony having him take a you know certainly because he wants uh, the opposing manager to pitch out I love this you know theft is legal in baseball <laughs> it was a section that I love you know so uh, when there's a guy on second base is he trying to tell telegraph location to the first base coach who will then telegraph it to the hitter I mean there are all these kind of hidden stories uh, that go on uh, in the game. So I think it's certainly made me, you know, hopefully a, a, a better fan and will make readers uh, better fans of the game. Well, there's a theory that pastoral sports like baseball, also golf, maybe horse racing, kind of lend themselves to better riding. You've written a best-selling football book. This book's already on the best-seller right. list of New York Times. Right. Do you buy into that a little bit? or? Well, I, I, I do and I don't. I mean, I think I, I've seen baseball, I've seen horse racing, boxing, I've mm -hmm. seen written about um, uh, beautifully. I think there is a certain poetry to the game. They are a beautiful game simply to watch. I mean, I think every kid remembers the first time when you walk into a major league stadium and you see that field and it just sort of lights up uh, your eyes. But you have to be careful. I mean, you know, if you do too much of the field of dreams, pastoral symphony stuff, you know, baseball is not a metaphor for anything mm -hmm. except baseball. It is not a metaphor for America. There's no attempt in this book to, to make it sort of symbolic of some larger American theme. You mean you know, baseball isn't a metaphor for life? Well, you know, <laughs> you know it, 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 it does. I think the emotions in baseball yeah. do ref reflect um, emotions uh, in life. But, you know, you, you have to like baseball to like this book. I make no bones about it. Whereas in Friday Night Lights, Friday Night Lights was never about high school football. It was really, you know, about the sociological yeah. impact, the way in which uh, a town, everything in that town sort of stemmed from high school football, you know, a, a different book. I think that the American themes evoked in, high, in front of the lights, you know, really worked, but mm -hmm. they don't work in all books. I think too many fiction writers, you know, stretch, you know, they, 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 this is symbolic of something going on in America, when to me the only thing it's symbolic of is the writer's attempt uh, to make it symbolic. Yeah. Now you're not a sports writer. No. You, yeah, you don't. You, no. you what, what grew up going to sports events, and, but right. you've written two sports books. Are you done? Are you? Are you, I, I, you know, I, I think I am done. I mean, as I said, what I like about Three Nights in August as a writer, it, it presented the kind of wonderful challenge of writing about the strategy in an interesting way. But the book is about much more than mm -hmm. strategy. I, I like writing things with a lot of human emotion and human heart, and there's and there's a lot of that in this book, whether it's Tony talking candidly about his personal life, whether it is how the team reacts when you have the death of a, of a bulldog, mm -hmm. wonderful pitcher, Daryl Kyle, in the middle of the season. You know, there's a section on, and I'm really haunted by what happened to Rick Ankeel, but you know, when he melts down, mm -hmm. when he loses this incredible, perfect, natural, God-given gift to pitch in the playoffs in 2000, and it's never the same. There's a lot of, a lot of moments watch. Um, in the book, like it, and you know the reviews have generally been terrific. I mean, the uh, Rocky Mountain News said it was the best baseball book of the decade. No, I don't know why you didn't say it was the best baseball book ever, but, <laughs> but you know, I'll, I'll, I will, I will take. Well, well I, I've, I've read it. I can <laughs> recommend it. And also, Friday Night Lights last year, Sports Illustrated mentioned that uh, ranked it as the number four sports That's book right. of all time. That's Before right. you're done with sports books, though, I would ask if you wouldn't mind reading a passage from your latest Three Nights. Oh, I'd, yeah, I'd love to. Let me while bend, you're looking for that, let uh, me bend down here. Uh, what's next for for Buzz Bissinger? Well, you know, I'm not I'm not really sure. I don't I don't have a, a a book project on the horizon. I've written three books. It takes me sort of almost embarrassing five or six years in between books. Um, I'm not very good at using really bad baseball cliches and, and analogies because I've written a baseball book. But I find finding book ideas, if you force it, it's like bunting. You generally just pop out. <laughs> you have to love whatever idea you're doing. It's hard enough writing a book if you love the idea. If you don't love the idea, uh, it's, it's a killer. So I do stuff for Vanity Fair magazine. I, I do mm -hmm. some uh, screenwriting, so I keep my finger uh, in all sorts of good uh, advice different, for, different pies. For those of us who haven't written our first book. Right. Well, you, you will. All of you will. 
This is a brief section uh, from the prologue. I just think it gets sort of to the heart of what, of what Tony La Russa in baseball uh, is about. As much as his job tormented him, he knew that managing a baseball team was a wonderful way to spend a life. It could be thrilling when it went right, when you did something that pushed in a run here and there, when you set up a defense and the ball, often so recalcitrant, obediently played right into the hands of that defense. There was exceptional excitement in the fact that for all the preparation you did, and Tony La Russa was always preparing, the game could never be scripted. As much as he knew, and he had spent his life trying to know, things he never could have imagined still routine, routinely happened, an odd, fantastic play that even if it went against you still made you secretly smile and wonder. When the game did work right, hummed along with that perfect hum that every fan recognizes, Will Russo would think simply, beautiful, just a beautiful baseball. Beautiful baseball. And I think that if that's sort of the <clears throat> motif of the book. You know, we have steroids, we always have some scandal in baseball. Mm -hmm. The game will endure, it's endured for over a hundred years. We will get through this. As George Will said, you know, it's a game worth paying attention to, and I think that's a beautiful way of putting it. If you pay attention to baseball, I think there's just nothing, nothing like it. I agree with you. That, that, this is a terrific book. I well, appreciate you. you joining us today, and, and uh, good luck down the road. Right, Buzz go, Bissinger, thank you. Go Razorbacks. Yeah. Big Razorback fan. <laughs>we are back with our Arkansas readers and we are ready to take a, a closer look at three nights in August. I want to introduce our panel to you and if uh, being a Cardinals fan uh, puts you in, in more qualified to be on this panel, we have a blue ribbon panel assembled here starting with Casey Wright Hi. of Fayetteville, Arkansas, graduate of Fayetteville High School, uh, now uh, completing your freshman year at the University of yes. Arkansas and a huge Cardinal fan, right? Of course. Right. <laughs> Taylor Carr, familiar to a lot of Arkansans, been in sports television for a long time around Little Rock and nationally, also a baseball broadcaster with the Travelers, also a, couple, a team in the South Atlantic League, also a Hawaiian team as well. So, Taylor, thanks for coming in today. And Steve Wright is our third panelist. Uh, he is the father of Casey Wright. That's a big deal on his resume. And, Steve, uh, you've seen his work in the Arkansas Democrat, the Arkansas Gazette, uh, freelance writer, uh, book writer as well, a very recognized figure around Arkansas in sports writing. Traveler fan since infancy, I suppose, right, Steve? Traveler fan, Cardinal fan. And Cardinal fan, I mean, excuse me, Cardinal fan. <laughs> yes, yeah, since yeah. birth. Since birth. All right. Well, and let's start with you, Casey. What, what, caused you, and I understand you went and sought out this book. You yes. were there the day it, it hit the store. Yeah. Why? I read, I saw it on the website, the Cardinals website, and my dad had told me about it, and it just really interested me, and I wanted to know the game of baseball a little more, just to, for my own knowledge, to be a fan of the sport, a better fan, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> had you read the other Buzz Bissinger book? No. You had not this read that. This was my first time writing his work. <laughs> right. And Taylor, you I know you read it for this program specifically, yeah. but you say you would have gotten the book in anyway, right? I love books about baseball, Tommy, and this one talks about the details so much and what goes on behind the scenes, and so it's a book I enjoyed and probably would have would have read eventually, but I really did enjoy it. You did enjoy it. And Steve, did you like the book? I thought it was great. Yeah. I, and and as a former sports writer and a and a, a lifelong baseball fan, I was really impressed with the detail uh, that I had no no awareness of, and and that kind of shocked me a little bit that there was that much in the game that I didn't know about. That's the first thing I wanted to ask you about this sports writer and his access. Well, not a sports writer, just a, a novelist, really, and, and, a, and a nonfiction writer, and his access, the level of his access to Tony Larusa and other members of his staff and the team as well, seems almost supernatural. Sometimes it's like he's living inside the mind of Larusa. Is this all legit? I mean, he's a he's a great writer with a great imagination, but it just seems like he has done a masterful job of getting inside this guy's mind. Well, and that's the mark of uh, I was explained to. Casey, the, the idea of creative nonfiction and what that means, and uh, books like Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, uh, Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff, uh, anything John McPhee has written, mm -hmm. you, you get there and uh, it, it's really hard work, and, and it shows you're, you're polishing something until it's as brilliant as this, and there, there's a lot of hard work there, and to, to get someone's confidence like that, uh, it's, that's an accomplishment in itself. Yeah. And then to get it on paper after you get that level of access. So, Casey, I'm going to let you explain to all our, 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 our viewers out there why why, they were, why this game was chosen. Why Cubs versus Cardinals? What's the significance of that? Oh, the Cubs versus Cardinals is the biggest rivalry ever. The Cubs hate the Cardinals. Cardinals hate the Cubs. And it was just, 
I don't think it was chosen, it just kind of happened this way, that they were vying for first place in the Central Division at this point of the season in 2003, and it was the Cardinals and the Cubs and the Astros that were all in it, and they all, it was just printed right there in the book, you know? Right, yeah, it really sets the table well, and it's a, it was a good series to yes. pick up on as well. And Taylor, I want you to explain why we in Arkansas, and Steve can chime in on this, for everyone who's listening, it doesn't know why so many Arkansas people are St. Louis Cardinals fans. Why is that? Well, the proximity for one thing, Tommy, we, for a long time St. Louis was the team the furthest west in Major League Baseball, and of course the Cardinals farm team was Arkansas for years and years, and three of the players in this book, Kerry Robinson, uh, Rick Ann Keel, and then one more, I'm trying, Matt Morris. Um, played significant roles in the Travelers in, in the late 90s. And so if you read the book and you're a Travs fan, you bring that with you. But I think it's a, the combination of being close to St. Louis right. and having the Travelers of the Farm Club that make everybody here, a lot of folks here, Cardinal fans. Yeah, everyone. Uh, growing up, you know, it seems like everyone is a Cardinal fan. Um, the things that he gets into, as you say, are, are fascinating, Steve. Things we never imagined. One of the things that fascinated me is all the things that a manager has to deal with in this day and age that he didn't have to deal with 40 or 50 years ago. you got guys making so much money these days that, uh, you know, whereas 50 years ago they might do something for the team, they want their team to get in the series, to make that series share of money and everything, now that's kind of walking around money for some of these guys with the, with the salary so out of whack. So instead of listening to the fans, sometimes they're listening to agents, they're listening to their families, they're doing what's, what supports that huge salary more than what supports the team. That's got to be uh, twice, as, uh, twice as big a burden for a manager. Well, yeah, there were two points in the book that... La Russa made that, that that was the biggest thing in 25 years that had changed, what motivates a player. And that other great uh, anecdote about Jose Canseco going through a World Series where he just got up there and taken three big cuts and sitting down. And La Russa confronting him with that, and he said, Tony, the, the fans would rather see me do that than try to, you know, hit and run or something. I, I'm, a, I'm a performer. Yeah, yeah. That's, it wasn't about team. It was all about him. Yeah, that just re incensed him in a big way, didn't it? Yeah. 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 But he's got to deal with that every day. And it's, it's just going to get worse, right? Well, he, he talks about players who can give about 75% and still make $5 million a year. They can give 100% and make $8 million, But, boy, $5 million is a ton of money. And so they get by giving about 75%. And that, I think, really got to him. That, in 25 years, as you said, is one thing he saw change. That was the character of the players and, and their values in, in playing the game. Yeah, one guy that fits that, uh, fits that description. In fact, those figures is J.D. Drew, and I know you're a big fan of J.D. You had huge expectations I, for J.D. Drew. His his portrayal of that story was yes, pretty vivid, wasn't it? He was. I was the biggest fan of him until I read this book, and then I was so disappointed <laughs> because he, he was just injured all the time. He wasn't a clubhouse player. He didn't have really any friends. They said he was a hermit in the dugout, and it just disappointed me. I want to have a favorite player that's a team player, gets along with everybody, you know, does his job, and he didn't. Yeah. He was just sit on the bench, injured yeah. all the time. <laughs> in uh, in J.D. Drew's case and a lot of other players, you can see by reading the book, if you didn't know before, why they're not with the Cardinals anymore, right, Steve? Uh, well, exactly. I mean, Tony LaRusse is not going to put up with that. But, the, the, again, that point you made, uh, Taylor, about uh, it, it pointed out that J.D. Drew grew up po uh, poor, and what the money he was making was going to be more than he ever needed. He didn't have to, to execute to, to do it. So it's hard for anyone else in to, you, you think, well, if I was there, I'd do this. You don't know no, until no. you get that $3 million check in your, in your pocket after one year of playing Major League Baseball. What is going to motivate you? Yeah. That's, that's the, the, the big problem for the managers in this day and age. Dave Duncan, one of the big supporting players in this book here. Very colorful figure, very interesting. Why is he interesting to you, Taylor? Well, because he is the one guy La Russa really the will pitching trust. Coach, I the should, pitching, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's the one guy that La Russa really trusts and who can who they really have a communication. And what Duncan does for the team in terms of handling those pitchers is so critical. And in La Russa, just going pitch by pitch in the corners of the plate the pitcher can use and not use. And that information from Duncan is so critical to him. He's the one guy who has access, I think, to his head during the season and throughout the games. Yeah, yeah. The counterpoint of La Russa's approach to managing, which is so much uh, based on intuition, it's, it's based on instinct and so forth like that, is played up against the, uh, one of the newer trends in managing baseball, if I've got this correct and you guys agree, of, of really stat-based, sort of geeky computer management of a baseball team and managing information that way and, and, and parceling out information that way. Bissinger obviously favors 
LaRusse's approach. Would you agree with that? I think so. It's just, I think the way he manages the team, you know, the hit and run, the all the little aspects really come out in this book that you really didn't know about, and it made it was a lot of detail oriented. The stats that players and pitchers that they have do good against certain pitchers, and it just was really interesting. And I think the way he does it is a lot better than. But I don't know how other managers do it, so I'm just going to be kind of biased. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Larusa really a guy who concentrates on matchups. Uh, and not so much looking at stats, but looking uh, looking at what he's got inside his brain. And that's I think uh, I think Bissinger does a great job of portraying that, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, and that that hit and run that Casey mentioned. That, so much detail on that that I had never considered before. And what a that that is an example of an intuition play because the odds of succeeding on that they talk about like 15 out of 50 is good. And the Cardinals in one season, of course. Uh, hitting the two triple plays. One, which has only happened 12 times in Major League history, an unassisted triple play when the hit and run was put on with Woody Williams at the plate and two men on and line drive, step on the bag, touch the other guy, three outs, just like that. Well, you don't hit and run, you don't hit to a triple play. So, All three of you mentioned that We've got aspects of the game brought to light in this book that you didn't realize happened before. The etiquette of beanball I found fascinating and, and how, you know, one of the top things on his to-do list every day for a month and a half was to figure out who on the Arizona Diamondbacks they were going to hit <laughs> after one of their play. I guess it was McGuire got, got brushed back by one of the Diamondback pitchers. I think he wound up going for his buddy, Luis Gonzalez, who he grew yeah. up with in Tampa, right? He called it the most agonizing decision he has to make as a manager, and that is decide how to retaliate when one of his players gets hit, who he hits on the other team to get back properly for one of his players being hit. I found that fascinating. Yeah, it really was. And, and La Russa is, is known for that reason as a very stand-up guy, yet in other parts of the book he is portrayed as sort of a lonely figure, someone who's not a real backslap or a real pal around guy. Uh, did that sort of form a contradiction in your mind, Casey? I kind of knew, like, just watching television on the games, that he would be by himself in the game during the game. They'd show him in the dugout, and it just kind of showed, you know, his mind's in the game all the time. It's not elsewhere. So that kind of makes me respect the game more and him being the manager and what he does. All right. He's a fascinating guy, that's for sure. Yes. A great subject for the book. The book, again, Three Nights in August by Buzz Bissinger, the story of uh, Tony LaRusso and Three Nights, a series between the Cards and the Cubs. Casey Wright, Steve Wright, Taylor Carr, thank you so much for, for reading the book and coming here and sharing your thoughts thank with us. You. Thank you. And thank you.